know the different parts of your spiritual armor of God, but also help defend the faith with the tough questions. And so if you've got tough questions, questions that you don't know the answer to, your parents say, hey, you know, I never really understood this about the Bible. Please write them down and give them to us so we can answer them. We want you guys to be a little bit more edumacated uh, so you can edumacated so you can go ahead and better defend yourselves and your faith. So, the breastplate of righteousness. Are we live? We good? Welcome online as well. Over the past two weeks, we have covered the shield of faith and the belt of truth. Today, we're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, Let's revisit Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. No, we're covering it again. It's a good scripture to memorize if you can. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against the rulers, against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, you stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. Guys, this is, this is long, but it's important. This is how you get your spiritual armor so you can stand against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So, so with that said, do, 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 do. why would Paul use a breastplate to stress the need for righteousness. What is a breastplate? Yeah, it, it, protects, it protects your chest, your vital areas. You got, you got all your vital organs right here, and you need to protect them. All right? A breastplate guards your torso, and you can... You can lose a limb, like you can lose an arm, and still be functional, but you know, this protects all the important stuff. Now, fun fact, up until World War II, these were still used, but they got, uh, they got you know, compromised with new weaponry, close range crossbows and small arms fire. And so the enemy is going to use those fiery darts and try to pierce that breastplate of righteousness. It may not have looked exactly like this, but you have, yeah, you can wear them under. They were typically, you know, a few millimeters thick, and they were heavy, but they protected your, your vital organs and vital areas. And, and all right, so we, we've established that the breastplate is a very important job. You know what a breastplate is? What's righteousness? According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, Righteousness means, righteous means acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. So you are in right standing with God. What's up? That's the Christian definition, yep. Righteousness can be defined as the quality of being morally right or justifiable. So we are told in this Ephesians letter to put on the breastplate of righteousness. So, pop quiz. Does this mean 
that we are inherently righteous. Why? Correct. Very, very good. You get a prize. You'll see it at the end. Yeah, very good. Now, now righteousness is not built into our DNA. And we go through our entire lives living this way, you know, because we are sinful creatures. We close ourselves with righteousness. There we go. We close ourselves with righteousness. So, there you go. There's your prize. The Upper Room Youth Bracelet. Yours cooler than mine because you got gold letters. There you go. Now you can... Now you can tell all your friends about Upper Room Youth. Yep. I made it. Ha ha. There we go. All right, let's stay on task. All right, so where then do we get righteousness from? If it doesn't come from us. Where does it come from? Yeah. Comes from the Lord. No, you're right. Go on. All right, it comes from Jesus. Now, check it. The Bible teaches that righteousness is based on what God says about what makes us right in His eyes. What makes us right or righteous in God's eyes is not anything that we have done. This is underlined for a reason because you need to get this. You are not righteous. God makes you righteous. It is our response to his grace by believing through faith that what God has told us about salvation through his son Jesus Christ is true. And does anyone remember last week with the belt of truth, what is truth? Oh, truth. Yeah, what's truth? Okay, circuitous answer, but good job. Now, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Truth, it's the same thing as the way and the life. Truth is God, but more, more specifically, Jesus, thank you. Very good job. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And... We covered two types of truth last week. Does everyone remember what types of truths they were? There was subjective truth and object. Dude, you were listening. You get a prize. Good job. The gentleman in the red cap. All right. All right. <laughs> Not quite a million dollars, but you know what? It's, it's some good, good bracelet armor. <laughs> now, this, what makes us righteous, is not anything that we have done, takes us to our first fiery dart of the evening. You guys ready? Fiery dart. Fiery dart. Ah! Christians are self-righteous. It's just fire. All right. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to darts next time. But we've got fire, and we've got a fiery dart. Christians are self-righteous. Their holier-than-thou attitude is awful, and I want no part of it. You got, no, you got people who say this. I'm sorry. Can I go back? Yes, I can. Well, if someone said that to you and you didn't know how to respond, I want to thank you for attending this class tonight because now you do. Yeah, that's true. I could thank you anyway. So one fiery dart 
that you're going to hear, and you already have, have, is Christians are self-righteous. Their holier-than-thou attitude is awful, and I want no part of it. Ouch. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Being called holier-than-thou. Funny thing is, we should never be self-righteous because we have no righteousness that belongs to us alone. When someone says something like this, it's probably because they have been hurt before by someone who is a Christian or professes to be one. Or they feel hurt because biblical truth, and we know Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, does not align with their values, how they think, and feel their subjective truth. So we, we always have to make sure that when people, that when we talk to people, we are communicating God's truth, not the subjective truth according to Max or Crystal or Aiden or Cameron or whomever. It is okay if someone has that argument to tell them. You're not righteous on your own. But that the righteousness of Christ lives within you. And you, and they can live in them too. No, not quite like that. Not quite. I'd work on that delivery. But good job. Thank you for your attempt. Now, you can break down righteousness for them in the true God, word of God style. Now, here are some reference points for what the Bible says about righteousness and to whom it belongs. All right. Who wants to read? Go go on, Judah. Sure. To bring to nothing things that are. Very good job. It's a lot. It's a little blurry? All right. So so God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So God, God likes the underdog, it sounds like, right? Yeah. And so, look, Jesus came into the all powerful God came into the world to become a servant and to become a sacrifice so that we could be righteous. We could be with Him. Makes sense? All right. All right. So, whoop. Thank you very much. So, another verse. I didn't put it up here because it is long as well. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 31. Pay attention. Come on, Aiden. I will. Not right now, though. We're in the middle of something. All right, so. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, bring nothing to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification 
and redemption. We are not righteous on our own. Christ Jesus is righteous. And when we are covered by him, we can walk in his righteousness. But let's be honest. Walking in his righteousness is pretty tough to do 24-7. And like it or not, we can often stumble in our walk. An angry word, mean-spirited outburst, you know, get mad at your sibling, go tattle on them. Uh, any other behavior that doesn't honor God all qualified as, as stumbling. If that action is seen by others, it can lead to our second fiery dart that the enemy uses to undermine our faith. Kind of like the first one, but a little bit different. Church is full of hypocrites. Christians talk a good game, but take a look at them when they're not in church. They don't practice what they preach. Anyone heard that? Yeah. I've heard it. I've seen it. I've lived it. I didn't practice what I preached. I was a hypocrite. And you know what? A good way to counter this is tell them, you know what? A lot of times, you're right. We can be hypocrites. Again, ouch. Paul said something really good about this struggle, though. Romans 7, 21 to 25. Anyone want to read this? No? Okay. All right, go ahead. Good job. No, you said you are. You're going to do it. Say do ratio, dude. Keep it one to one. You said it. Let's do it. Very good reading. Right. Slow clap. Oh, you getting the slow clap. <laughs> Woo! Good job, sir. All right. All right. Being a believer does not make us perfect. Our spirit is born again and sits with Christ in heavenly places but we will still wrestle with our soul and body. Those areas can be what others look at and call hypocrisy. We cannot allow ourselves to forget that we are not the righteous ones, but Christ who makes us righteous. He is the one who forged that breastplate of righteousness, but it is up to us to put it on and keep it on. Now, how does Christ make us righteous? Does anyone know? How, how does he do it? We know why he does it, but how? Hmm? Salvation, all right? How do we get it? Yeah, I mean, you're getting there. So... Christ makes us righteous because this goes back and ties to him dying on the cross for us. All right? Because while we, are, we as Christians believe and say that Christ died for us and that he washes us clean or whatever terminology we try to use, if you were asked how all that worked, the mechanics of why Jesus is our Savior because he died on the cross, could you answer that? How does that all work? Okay. Well, then you can't answer that. You did hear something. What did you hear on the radio? No, 
No. Kind of quite, but no. All right, so let's go into this. Why does this, why does this make such a big difference? The guy got hung on a tree, and, and we somehow just transfer our sins to him. He got hung on a cross. We transfer our sins to him. How does that work? Why does that work? In order to understand why putting our sin on Jesus, why his dying on a cross makes us right with God, we got to go back to the Old Testament. And we got to look at what was called a sin offering. So, what is sin? What is sin? Can anyone tell me? It's right there. Yes, it's an archery term. Sin is what it's called when you throw a dart or an arrow, or you fire an arrow at a target and you miss. That's called sin. So, God has a standard that he has told us and that he has set, that we hit our target, that we follow his rules, that we do what he says. And when you sin, you miss that mark. You do not do what he says. You fail to meet that standard. You miss. We sin. And when that happened back in Jesus' day and before that, God outlined how we could atone for that sin and make right with God. Does anyone know what the Israelites did to get in right standing? They made a sacrifice. They killed a cow. No. There was lots of different sacrifices, but they... Yeah, they eventually they had to kill Jesus. But in this specific instance, for a sin offering, to wash away the sins of the Israelites for an entire year, they would offer up what's called a lamb, a Passover lamb. And so with this Passover lamb, when sacrificed, it was a spotless lamb, it was perfect, they were washed clean. Their sins transferred to the lamb. So you see in how both the Old and New Testament, in in this case, the New Testament, a different lamb appears. One that is Jesus. And so so we see these passages in in Genesis and in the New Testament with John. Genesis 22, 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Here is one of the earliest examples of how something was transferred over to that ram instead of of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. And then in John 1.29, we see in the New Testament Jesus being that sacrifice, that Lamb of God. Oh, there you go. That aha moment just got there. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That that was spoken by John the Baptist, his cousin, Jesus' cousin, and recognized that Jesus was, was to be that Passover lamb, that lamb of God, who will take away the sin, the missing the mark of the world. Everyone with me so, so far? No? Where, where am I losing you? I, I, I'm stuck on the first page. Okay. Are you good? Okay. All right. So here we see that crucial parallel. Jesus is that lamb, the spotless sacrifice so that we are in right standing with God, so that we can be called righteous and holy, not by anything that we have done. Wow, that's loud. But through Jesus. So when we are confronted with our hypocrisy, or we are called unrighteous people, 
we can respond that through Jesus and his sacrifice, that he makes us righteous. Through him, we can work on ourselves by doing what he said. And what he said is something that most people, even the ones arguing with you, can get on board with. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, and you shall love the Lord your God. What? I'm sorry. Go ahead and read it. Correct. There is another commandment greater than these. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you truly love your neighbor, and who is your neighbor? You love Jesus. He's your neighbor, yeah. Every person on earth. Everybody is your neighbor. What? You don't have a neighbor? These are your neighbors. What, what's your name? Everyone's your neighbor. And they're your neighbors. So, if you loved your neighbor as yourself, if you tr truly love your neighbor as yourself, and the person arguing with you saying, hey, you guys are hypocrites. If you love them as your neighbor, and they loved you, would there be an issue to begin with? Give that man a bracelet. He gave the right answer. He said, you still love them. Hugh. All right. So, yes, even if they still call you a hypocrite, even if they call you names, even if they say, you know what, you guys are self-righteous people and you know that you're not righteous on your own by yourself, that Jesus gives you that, you still love them as your neighbor. Because that's what Jesus called you to do. But the hardest part about this is not just loving your neighbor, even if they don't like you. The hardest part about this is not even loving God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The hardest part about all All your flaws, the fact that you miss the mark, and then working to better yourself every day because of Jesus, because of what he did for you. Becoming more like Jesus every day because of what he asks you to do. So, so to recap, if you don't want someone to have the idea that we are self-righteous people and hypocrites who don't practice what we preach, it boils down to this. Love God. Love others. Love yourself. If everyone did this, we'd be in a pretty good place. No. Yes. I know. Like, I wish I could give you two, but we don't have that many. So, yes, you love God first. You love others second. You love yourself last. That is exactly what Jesus did. That's what he modeled. That is righteous behavior. And righteousness does not come from us. But who? God. How is that confusing? Mm-hmm. 
He's also your neighbor. So Jesus is all three. No, no. Because you love God. You love God first. Yeah, but he wouldn't do that. That's not his character. And so the thing of it is, is that you, personally, you, loving yourself means you'll be able to love your neighbor better. Because your hardest judge of your own behavior is yourself. How you look, how you feel, how you act, how you think. So when you feel good about finished a little bit early so that we could have time to recap this lesson as well as some of the previous lessons to make sure that you guys are prepared for these fiery darts because we've covered six of them so far. All right. Now, we've done three weeks. We've done three weeks with two fiery darts each. So, 